All right. Good morning, church. It's great to see everybody here. Well, do we serve an everlasting God? Amen. Uh, we're going to praise the everlasting God this morning. Let's kick it off.
You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not faint, you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like he goes. Hallelujah. How many of you know what it's like not to have any strength and not know what to do? <laughs> and that song is right out of God's word. <laughs> he's our defender. He's our strength. He's our savior. His word says he's everything that we need. If you need something today, He's the answer for that. <laughs> if you have questions, that's okay. And if you're angry, that's okay too. He loves you right where you're at. <laughs> Whatever you got going on, <laughs> there's nothing we can think or feel or parts of us that just get dead that he's like, oh no, <laughs> that's too much. He died for us. That was the ultimate. <laughs> there's nothing you need that his death can't give you and his love isn't wide enough for our next song is Potter's Hand. What he asks is that we let him be Lord and not hold anything back. To tell him it all and to invite him into it. Beautiful Lord, wonderful Savior, I know for sure all of my days are held in your hand. Crafted into your perfect plan. You gently call me into your presence, guiding me by your Holy Spirit. Teach me, dear Lord, to live all of my life. Captured by your holy calling, set me apart. I know you're drawing me to yourself. Lead me, Lord, I Me, fill 
name's Jesus. Without Jesus, there's no hope for us. The grace of God shown through his son Jesus is the only way to salvation, the only way to heaven. We thank you, Lord, for this gift of grace that you freely bestowed on us. Thank you for the hope that you bring. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Well, you can all greet each other this morning. Take a few minutes to greet each other and give a couple holy handshakes and no holy no holy kisses this morning. So, all right. Good morning, everyone. I trust you're able to meet and greet enough people. Um So we appointed my daughter here to do the announcements, but but you got to start them early, volunteering, helping out at the church. So what's 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 the first one? Okay, I'll I'll do the I'll do the first one. <laughs> All right, um, I just want to say welcome to everybody. Welcome to our guests. Just want to let everybody know. That, um, we have some more of what we just did here, the meet and greet and fellowship. After the service, it'll be next door in the fellowship hall. We got some coffee and we got some snacks and it'll be a great time. So um, don't be in a hurry to leave. Don't be a stranger. Um, talk to someone, get to know someone. And um, these relationships are what make us a church body. They will bind us together. So um, yeah, take advantage of that. Um, all right, and then we're on to the tent meeting. Nope, we're all not in that one. Okay, well, the cool summer fundraiser, no? All right, just pick one, and I'll do the announcement on it. <laughs> all right, tent meeting. Tent meeting. We're planning a tent meeting for the August weekend of August 20th through the 22nd. Um, I believe the reason Pastor and Eileen aren't here is because they're trying. Are they in Oklahoma this they're in Oklahoma trying to get the speaker for the tent meeting. So 
the meeting with the speaker. So the things are in the works. Things are happening behind the scene to make this happen. And this is all going to be going on the same weekend as our free carnival. Um, yes. So, yes. So the carnival is on the 21st from 11 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And the tent meeting is that same weekend, the 20th to the, the 22nd. Do you have anything you want to say on that? Um, the men are meeting tonight, correct? Who knows more about that? Okay, who's, who's leading that tonight? George, you are? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Are you leading it tonight, John? Okay, I, I assume John left it in somebody's hands. Maybe they're not here, but the men are meeting at 6, and the youth group is meeting um, at the Rock at the same time. So, all right, and then I've got, what's the next one? Oh, CORE, our ministry for young adults, 18 to 27, meets every Wednesday at 6.30. All right, S 6 o'clock. For the core. So if you know any um, young adults, um, this is actually a really big need because having been event, well, before, I'm, I'm too old now. I'm 29 now. I'm too old. They told me I tried to come. They, they wouldn't let me come. So, <laughs> but, but um, there's actually really is a big need for um, ministry for young adults because a lot of people after they get out of college and high school, they just feel left behind. If they're single people, they feel left behind or forgotten by the church in a lot of cases. My assistant's getting a little uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> but um, So if you know any young adults who are looking for a ministry or just young people to connect with, um, connect them with CORE. And Reese, the leader of that ministry, is actually here today. So um, what's the next slide? We got the prayer meetings. This week we're only having the morning prayer meeting. That's here at 10 a.m. this Thursday. Yeah, it is just the morning one, so. Um, what else? Um, our daily bread, new additions for June and July and August are in the lobby, and it's free. And then, um, so we are live streaming this service most weeks. This week we had some technical difficulties, so we're actually not live on the air right now, but we'll be working through that so we can be live. So if you have anybody who's interested in um, checking out what we're doing here at the Ridge, but they're not willing to, you know, make the plunge to come here in person. You can always um, link them to our Facebook page so they can see what we do here for worship and speaking at the Ridge. Um, and then we have a very exciting announcement. I'm sure you guys all saw out front. The trailer is here. The, we're seeing the fruits of the cool summer fundraiser. Um, Reese, did you have anything you wanted to share on that? Or I figured you would. You wouldn't pass up an opportunity. It's always a mistake giving me the microphone. So yes, the trailer's here. Um, it's so fantastic to just see all that come together and how we're working on getting that cool summer. Um, I think the Summer Weekends Festival is what we're calling it. Um, so we'll actually have, I think starting in July, We'll be doing Fridays and Saturdays, just a mini festival with the shaved ice trailer as well as an elephant ear trailer and hopefully maybe another trailer. We're kind of talking with some people on that as far as just food and then we'll have some yard games and things for everyone to come and enjoy. Um, so if you like after service for you guys to just come out and check out the trailer, walk through it, you know, see what, you know, us as a body, as a church, um, we're able to make and get and how we're going to use that to just bless the community um, and this church. So, yeah. Thank you for all you do, brother. All right. Um, that's all the announcements I have. Is there anything else anyone would like to share or anything we need to be made aware of? Oh, I did need to share a bit of news um, regarding the, the, food, the, um, the food boxes. So for those of you who hadn't heard through Facebook or, or Flock Note, 
um, the truck carrying our food boxes was involved in an accident. Um, as far as I'm aware, no one was hurt because the truck was actually parked when it was struck. But because of the um, perishable nature of the food, the, um, the food box distribution is, uh, is going to be canceled. So all together for right now. So um, hopefully we'll get more information on that um, as we continue to um, communicate with that program. But um, I'm, saying, I'm saying that right, uh, Donnie, right? Um, Okay, because of the damage and everything like that. So, um, so just uh, keep praying for that. Pray that we can get that event back here eventually. But that that truck and those that food is not going to be making its way to the ridge this time. But it was a really great outreach. The last time we were able to do that, we made a really big impact on the community. Um, so um, just keep keep praying. God will move. Um, he'll show up in a big way. So. Um, all right, um, and with that, I'd like to invite the ushers forward to take the offering. All right, let me say a blessing for the offering real quick. Um, dear Lord, we thankful, thank, we thank you for the giving hearts that you placed here at the Ridge. Um, you allowed us to do um, so much with what you've given us. Um, Thank you for um, the gifts that you're about to receive and what you're going to do in the future through those gifts. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. This morning, we have a, a special treat. Brother Jamil from the congregation is going to be sharing with us this morning um, in Pastor John's place. So excited to hear what, what word God has given him to share with us today. Uh, let me pray for you. Uh, dear Lord, we're thankful for Jamil and the ministry that he has um, um, here at the Ridge and um, across the world. Um, we're thankful in advance for what he's going to share with us. Just open our hearts and ears to what he has to say this morning. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was so happy to see... Uh, Gareth's assistant. She did great. No noise. <laughs> Let claps for her. <laughs> yeah. She did great. Yeah, usually the children are very crazy when they are in front of people, but everything goes smooth. <laughs> Praise God. So our topic is God cares. Do I? But before I share that topic, I want to tell, as Brother Garrett told, today is a very special day. It's not like our pastor is not here. We are missing our pastor. Already, <laughs> we are missing our pastor. But today is special and significant. It's significant and special for two reasons. Historically, do you know what is day to day? Historically, Pentecost Sunday. This is Pentecost Sunday. You know, and another, contemporarily, May 23rd is dedicated by churches to celebrate as a day of prayer for unreached, for internationals, you know. On Pente Pentecost Sunday, Jesus fulfilled his promise 
and blessed his disciples, providing the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, uh, 1 to 13, we see the whole story. The celebrations of this Christian festival takes place on the 50th day, that is seventh Sunday from Easter Sunday. The Holy Spirit was descended upon the apostles and the ordinary people who would come to know Jesus as their savior. And the tongues of fire came to rest on each of them. No one has power or ability to understand himself adequately unless he has the Holy Spirit. Thank God. His Holy Spirit descended on the Pentecost Sunday upon apostles and other believers who were from different nations. In Acts 2, 9 and 11, it is mentioned there, uh, the people from different nations, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Sidon. Visitors from Rome, Cretans, and Arabs were declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues. The unreached or internationals who are not able to understand the mystery of God's grace still, do you know why? Why they are not able to recognize Jesus as their savior? Why? Because they are missing the power of the Holy Spirit. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only, only through the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, it is so clear. While we are sitting here in his presence, we are in daddy's home, we are in father's home. We are brothers and sisters, and we are before his throne. I want to challenge you to think about seriously. Let Holy Spirit talk to you. Who you are in his kingdom. You know, we, we were singing songs. God, you are savior. Jesus, you are savior. You are redeemer. You are my Lord. But I want to put that question before, your, before you guys, before the congregation who you are in his kingdom. Most of the time we think about God, but who am I? What is your perspective about yourselves or others? We need to think thoughtfully, thoughtfully. If we consider ourselves a part of his kingdom, then how do we are playing our role as a kingdom person? On seeing internationals, the unreached and the Gentiles, do I really recognize myself as a kingdom person? You know, in Obadiah 1, because of the violence, Obadiah 1, uh, 10 to 11, it is mentioned there, because of the violence against your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. On the day you stood aloof, you should not gloat over your brother in his misfortune. And there is another reference from Jeremiah 27, 18. If they are prophets and have the word of the Lord, let them plead with the Lord Almighty that the articles remaining in the house of the Lord and in the palace of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem and not to be taken to Babylon. Keeping in view our title, God cares do I, and two verses from the book of Obadiah and Jeremiah, I want to bring in attention three points to figure out one question. Where are we standing? Or a better question to think deeply, why do I stand aloof? Obadiah reveals to us, on the day you stood aloof, on the day you stood aloof, what is it that day? I believe this day speaks about each day that we are living on this earth. What is it to stand aloof? Stand aloof means showing disinterest, keeping ourselves reserved. It is avoiding someone. It mirrors arrogant attitude toward the lost brethren. 
toward the lost ethnicities, toward the people who are not believing in Christ. We would have been good, loving, and charitable within the church family, within the church community, or within inner circles, but who we are, who we are when we are in outer circles, who we are when we are in the harvest field, who we are at the marketplace or at mall, how do we respond seeing internationals? Do we keep the distance? Do we consider ourselves superior, showing attitude to them? And this happened a lot. Or do we approach them with Christ-like love? Where are we standing on May 23rd? This day is for praying day for the internationals. Are we friendly to them to talk back and forth? Or to show how much Jesus loves them and what he did for them? We will dig deep. Three characters keeping in view one great challenge of our great mandate. These people are, no matter they are white, they are black, or they are yellow, or they are brown, whatever ethnicities, whatever color they have, they are brethren. They are brethren. So one great mandate, the great commandment, and the great commission. I am fully convinced you, you are aware, what do I mean by it? The great commandment is, the great commandment is what? Love God. Love God. And the second is same. Love. Love your neighbor. Love people. Love God. Love people. And the great commission is what? Go. Go. And tell people Jesus' story. Go and tell people Jesus' story. Isn't this true? Love God. Love all people. That's it. What the Savior demands from his people. Our Lord wants us to see an accelerating momentum of brotherly love. Prophet Obadiah used the term brother for making clear how important they are. In God's view, the descriptive dictionary of brother, brotherly love is so deep and wide. The Greek word, philadelphia, for brotherly love means love shared between a biological brother and sister. When we use the term brother and the word that is used in, in our Bible, that is the, the word philadelphia, and it means we are supposed to show brotherly love as we need to show brotherly love between our biological brothers and sisters. And that's not all. We are supposed to love people not only with brotherly love, but more. The climax of Christian love that we found in Bible, it is like love people with Christ-like love. If you want to see John 15, 13, we are supposed to love like Christ. How did Jesus love to us? How did Jesus love? Giving his life. Sacrificing his life for us. And we are supposed to love with that love. And then in Matthew 22, verse 39, if you want to see in your Bibles, you can see. Love as you love yourself. How do I love myself? I want to wear a nice shirt. I want to have good food. I want to take better care of me. Whatever is good for me. Whatever is nice is for me. Whatever is the best is for me. Love your neighbor. Love people as yourself. We can show love, mercy, kindness, or compassion if we are not showing merciful acts. But how can we express complete love or full mercy without showing Jesus' death and resurrection to them. Which is in a sense is the completion of the Great Commission. Well said by A.W. Tozer, mercy is not something God has, but something God is. Most of the time, church wants to approach internationals with these things. Okay, I have food for you. I have clothing for you. I will give you medical assistance. All these things are good because these are merciful acts. 
But in reality, these are not fulfilling the Great Commission requirements. Mercy is not something God has, but something God is. God is mercy. Does the Great Commandment have any impact if the Great Commission is not the finishing point? What's the point? If there is no Great Commission, we cannot, uh, we will say there is, there, there is no, uh, if we are not fulfilling the Great Commission, the Great Commandment, we are missing too. In fact, we cannot separate these two. They are divinely overlapped. The Great Commandment and the Great Commission to each other. They are divinely overlapped. And they work together. The great commandment will go vain without implementing the great commission. We need to reach nations, the internationals, and the unreached people. We can't ignore them as we know they are our brothers and sisters. And we are supposed to bring them in the Father's house. Though they deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ, still we will approach them and do not overlook them. They are brethren and in miserable situation. So three characters I want to present. A slave, a prophet, a child. A slave, a prophet, a child. A slave of God, Obadiah. The book of Obadiah, that is the shortest book in the Old Testament. Obadiah. Obadiah means a servant or a slave of God. A worshipper of Jahweh God. Let me tell you uh, the relationship between a slave and the Lord sharing Juan Carlos' story. The story is a wonderful ref reflection of a slave and a master's relationship. And I want to invite the father and son team to present their story of a buyer and seller to reflect the story of a slave and a master. So we have father and son team. <laughs> I did talk to uh, Brother George this morning so, uh, and shared with him that I, I need your help with this thing. Okay. <laughs> so um, I want to buy this pearl. How much is it? Very expensive. How much? A lot. Well... I could buy it? Oh, yes, everyone can buy it. But I thought you said it was very expensive. I did. So, how much? Everything you have. All right, I'll buy it. All right, what do you have? I have $10,000 in the bank. All right, $10,000. What else? Well, that's all. Nothing more? Well, I mean, I got a few dollars in my wallet. How much? Uh, about a hundred dollars. Well, that's mine too, then. <laughs> what else do you have? That's all. Nothing else. Where do you live? Well, in my house. I mean, I own my home. All right, a house. Well, that's mine too. Well, where do you expect me to sleep? In my camper? Oh, you have a camper or Jeep. That's it. Okay, now where do you expect me to sleep? In my car? Uh, oh, you have a car as well? Yes, I have two. Well, they're both mine now. Wait, wait. <laughs> so, you've taken my money, my house, my camper, and now my cars. Well, where's my family supposed to live? So you have a family? Yes, I have a wife and three kids. Well, they're mine now. <laughs> And oh, I almost forgot, you yourself too. Everything becomes mine. Your wife, your children, your house, your money, your cars, and even you. Now listen, I'll allow you to use all these things for the time being, but don't forget that they're all mine, just as you are. Whenever I need any of them, you must give them up because I'm now the owner. Thank you. Do we recognize ourselves as slaves of God. Do we? 
I know socially this title is not acceptable to consider ourselves as the slaves. We do not want to consider ourselves as slaves. What is your opinion about it? What do you think about it? Am I correct or not? Even we are hesitant to use the term, the slaves of God, for ourselves. People like to call themselves reverent, the most reverent, doctor, pastor, evangelist, minister, deacon, deaconess, elder, or bishop. Have you ever heard someone has titled slave, slave Jamil? But you will see on my book, Dr. Jamil, not slave Jamil, a slave of God. No. We want to use other titles. It is not socially acceptable to us. But the great apostle Paul, the prophets, and our savior, our Lord Jesus, they use the same terms, slaves. The whole gospel of Mark presents Jesus as a servant. Whole book of Mark, that is the theme of the book. That is the theme of that gospel. Jesus is servant. And Paul mentioned many times, and he considered always himself a born servant or a slave of Christ. Paul said, slide nine, Paul said back, In Romans 1, 14 and verse 15, Paul said, I am obligated to both to Greeks and non-Greeks, but to the wise and the foolish. That's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. What does it mean obligated? I am obligated. I am bind legally. Obligated means I am bind legally. If Paul is bind legally, what about us? We are living flip-flop life spiritually. Oh, I'm good. I'll come to church, I'll pay the tithe, and I'm good. And Paul says, I am obligated to both Greeks and non-Greeks, Jews and Gentiles. To, church, to people who are in the church and the people who are not in the church. I am obligated to preach. To let them know about Jesus. To share Jesus' story. I am obligated. God says, if I am a master, where is the respect due me? Where is the respect due me? If I am your master, why don't you show respect to me? How do we show respect to master? Obeying him. Obeying whatever he asked us to do. If we will obey, in this way we will show respect to him. And God is saying, if I am your master, why don't you show respect to me? Can we analyze ourselves how many days or hours in a week or a month we did take his commission seriously? We Christian people, we believe in great commission, but are we taking that commission seriously? Aren't we standing aloof? Can we think deeply to live differently for giving glory to God according to his purposes? God cares. Do I? Why do I stand aloof? Why? Obadiah declares, on the day you stood aloof in the day of his misfortune. What is our situation having internationals among us? Isn't this true? Without knowing Jesus, the people are living in the day of their misfortune. No matter how rich they are, they are in miserable situation. No matter how rich they are, how educated they are. It doesn't matter because if they don't know Jesus, they are in miserable situation. Our worldly perspective inspires us to believe that people are in miserable situation when they are hungry, thirsty, and without medicine, when they are illiterate, and without a place to live, or they are naked or clothed in tattered, and they have no shelter. Let me tell you straightforwardly. If people are hungry, 
or thirsty or wounded or naked or illiterate, it would be the smallest misfortune. If we will compare it with the loss of getting joy of eternity dwelling with Jesus Christ. No matter if a person who lives in Fifth Avenue in the New York, at Fifth Avenue in New York, the very expensive place. But if he doesn't know Jesus Christ, he is in miserable situation. He will spend his eternity in hell without knowing Jesus. No matter how rich he is. The people are in greater trouble if they are not aware of saving knowledge of Christ. We need to keep our eyes on the fact that they will not only suffer and be away from, his, from, this, from Jesus' sweet presence, but they will also spend their eternity in the hell. Trust me, if we are not reaching them to redeem from the clutches of the adversary, we are standing aloof and showing callousness and insensitivity. The second character, the prophets. And it is mentioned in Jeremiah 27, 18. If they are prophets and have the word of the Lord, let them plead with the Lord Almighty that the articles remaining in the house of the Lord and in the palace of the king of Judah and in Jerusalem and not be taken to Babylon. God Almighty speaks through prophet Jeremiah, disclosing and uncovering the giftedness and the privilege of the prophets. The positional prestige and the glorious status of prophethood has explained in detail. It expresses how powerful and remarkable is prophet's personality and how esteemed and valuable is his speech for Almighty God. We find these two remarkable things. The word of the Lord has entrusted to them and they were chosen for intercession. El Shaddai, the God Almighty, has testified on his word in such a way. The word that he provided to his prophets. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish. So that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word. That goes out from my mouth. It will not return to, my, to me empty. But will accomplish what I desire and achieve. The purpose for which I sent it. In Isaiah 55 and verses 10 and 11. And no doubt the power of God's word is. According to Jeremiah 23, 29. His word works like fire. It is consuming fire in itself. It is as powerful as hammer to break a rock into pieces. And Psalm 138 verse 2 explains, God has magnified his word above all his name. Above all his name. That is the power of his word. Can you imagine this profound and life-giving word God entrusted us? That is not only for the prophets. God has entrusted that mighty word to us. Can you imagine why did he do this? The prophets were not supposed to keep this God-given assignment, the light and guide of his word under a basket or to them only. Instead, they were supposed taking a hold of the mysteries of his word to reveal to people and ethnicities to shape up civilizations and societies. They had been prepared by God to proclaim his word and announce his decrees. God has provided them his word. And they were, they were supposed to spread his word. God says, If they are prophets and have the word of the Lord, let them plead with the Lord Almighty. Using my word. They were, they were supposed to plead using God's word. But they were not using that word. The pride, the beauty of the holy temple and the glory of the Israelites was at stake. As the Babylons were taking away the great bronze basins, the pillars and the stands, the cups, the plates and the cutleries of the Lord's house. The precious belongings of the holy city and of the holy temple. And the prophets were 
startled and stunned and were doing nothing seeing all this. They were not ready even to stand in prayer to intercede. Instead, they were just viewing all this haplessly. That was prophet's duty at that time to speak word, to speak his word. Argue God. God, no. Save us from this captivity. We want to save these articles. We want to see all these objects. These are for your glory. These basins, these pillars, these cloth, this clothing. Everything is for you. Babylon, Babylonian will not take away. Lord, where are you? They, they, they were supposed to say all these things. But they were dumbfounded. Saying nothing. The Lord God by sending his word. Awake them up for their slumbering situation. He wants to drive them out from their disinterest. Inaction and sluggish behavior. God does his best to inspire them through his word. If the word of the Lord. Is with you. If the word of the Lord is with them. And if they really believe they are prophets. Then. Why are they hesitating? Why are not they ready to intercede? The Lord God wanted to convince his prophets. If they implore sincerely using the power of his word. With true hunger and thirst. With humility and honesty. They can stop the Babylonian aggression. You know. I dare to ask you loudly and with humility. That each New Testament believer. Has been honored to call a prophet. Are you agree with me? If I will say brother Dan is. Sitting behind. Is a prophet. And you will be amazed. Might be. Uh, some of you will say. No it's not possible. Brother Don is. A prophet. Sister Stephanie is a prophetess. No. This would be itching. For many of us. Let me tell you. The New Testament believers have. Exceptional status in the Lord God's sight. Each person who declares Jesus is the Lord declares it by the power of the spirit of prophecy. And I am not saying out of love. I am not saying out of passion. I am not saying uh, because I believe in that. I am saying because the word of God declared it. In Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. For it is the spirit of prophecy. It is the spirit of prophecy. Who bears testimony to Jesus. Who bears testimony to Jesus. And I believe. At Ridge. In our congregation. There is not a single person who. Who is not able to declare Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Whoever declare. Whoever proclaim, whoever profess that word, Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Redeemer. He's not saying by his passion. No. He's not saying by his intellect. No. He is saying out of the power of the spirit of prophecy. And the third character that I want to uh, bring before, your, uh, before you guys... That is like a child. New Testament believers are more than slaves or prophets. We are, we are the children of the, of the most, most high God. Not ordinary God. Not territorial God. Not God of this land or this land or this mountain. No. The most high God. Most high God. The king of kings. And the lord of lords. That is our God. People have territorial God. Okay if you will go to that mountain. You would be able to see the power. And authority of that God. But my God. And our God. Is God of everywhere. Every place. Every region. Every continent. Every country. That is our God. So we, we are better than slaves. We are better than prophets. You know. His spirit is moving and working in us. And in Romans 8.17. No, if we are children. Romans uh, 8.17. It is there. No doubt we are the heirs of God. 
the Father and the co-heirs with Christ. What does it mean? Everything that Jesus has is mine also. I am co heir with him. Each brother and sister, they have same position, same status in front of God, in God's sight. The word that has provided us is awe-inspiring, exalted, and sublime. The author of the Hebrews epistle demonstrates the sublimity of the New Testament believers in such a way. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. You know, the Old Testament believers had partial portion of the word of God. But us, the New Testament believers, had the supreme, the complete, and the final word of God. They had just portion. But we have the full gospel, the full word of God, complete, superb. The final word of God. Us, the New Testament believers, are also dealing with the supreme, the final revelation of God Almighty with dishonest attitude. That is a miserable situation. Like the Old Testament prophets, we are not opening our lips, opening our mouth with his word. We are not. We have complete the full and the super word of God. But we are not using like Old Testament prophets. We are dumbfounded. We have internationals among us. How many times we are praying using his word. We are showing same attitude. Helpless, downhearted, hopeless, like the Old Testament prophets. We know well, being a child of God, Jesus gave, we know well, Jesus gave his life to save the lost nations of the world. We are not ready for opening up our lips for the nations of the world. It is certain there are billions of people who are not able to recognize the truth of the Savior. Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, they are without Savior. They have no clue. They don't know about Jesus. People are imprisoned in idolatry and they are entrapped by the fantasies of this alluring world. Being captured by false ideologies and vain philosophies, they are dying moment by moment going towards Babylon. Figuratively, symbolically, a city for death, sin, frustration, and destruction. They are involving themselves in orgies of the cultic and occult activities from the dawn of every day to dusk of every night. And we are failing to play our role. Not only reaching them to share good news, but also for not opening our lips to intercede and stand in the gap for them. The supreme creator, the almighty God, is worried about the lost. Does he have no concern for them? Billions of people? Is he only concerned, is he has only concern for us? What about billions of other people? It is written in the word of God. And should I have not concern for the great city of Nineveh? In which there are more than a hundred and twenty thousand people who cannot tell them, who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also so many animals. If God does care about animals, and if God does care about a number, hundred and twenty thousand people, and God is showing saying they, they can't tell their right hand from their left, they're innocent. What about these billions of people? But God is waiting for his children. So his children will speak. So his children will open their lips. So his children will open their mouth. To shout. To cry. To plead. Lord we need these nations. Lord we need these people. But we are good. We are good. We are happy in church circles. We are the custodians of his supreme. The holy and the final revelation. We are 
the keepers of his word. We are supposed to open our lips. God says, if I am a father, where is my honor? Where is the honor due me? Why don't you honor me? You, you consider yourself, you are a child of God. You are the children of God. So where is my respect? Where is my respect? God cares, so he says. Like if you will see in Obadiah chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. And it is mentioned there. You should not gloat over your brother. In the day of his misfortune. We can say many things about Muslims or about Hindus or about Buddhists. You should not gloat over your brother in the day of his misfortune. You should not march through their gates. You should not wait at the crossroads to cut down their fugitives. You know, what is happening? How do we are taking internationals in our society? We stand aloof. And the day of the Lord is near for all nations. You know, in Obadiah verse 15, it is mentioned there. We are standing aloof. We stand aloof. And the day of the Lord is near for all nations. God is not coming for Christians only. God is coming for all nations. If we are standing aloof. Isn't this mirror arrogant attitude toward the lost brethren? Where are you standing? Where am I standing? The day of the Lord is near for all nations. Church, there are two takeaways for you from this very verse that I wanted to put before you. Yahweh God remembers internationals. They are his belongings. They are not far or aloof. He remembers them because he is covenant-keeping God. And he did, he did invest a lot. What did he invest? What is his investment? What do you think? What did Jave invest, invest for us? What did he invest? His son. Who can, who can invest such a great thing? He invested the life of his son to save people. Truth is, internationals are sons and daughters of Abraham. Are we ready to bring them in Jesus' flock? Do not ignore it that they are brethren. They are in desperate need to get saved. Shall we keep standing aloof? Sister Stephanie, would you please? Uh, shall we keep standing aloof, showing no interest for their salvation? Do we dare to ignore our mandate to reach them in their misfortune circumstances? Do we behave like Edomites, putting accusations or charges or allegations? Edom was treating Israelites as strangers. How do we treat internationals? We need to think thoughtfully that sin includes not only what we do, Listen carefully. Sin includes not only what we do, but also what we refuse to do. That is sin too. Sin is not only what we do, it is also what we refuse to do. Apostle James says, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. So what do you think when you are at mall or uh, at some, you are, you are at park and you are confronting with some international, some unreached person, some Muslim person, Hindu or some Buddhist man or sister, how would you see them? What's, what you are supposed to do? What you are supposed to do? Share Jesus' story. Talk back and forth. Don't stand aloof. Involve with them. Involve them in conversations. 
Because you know that if they, they will come to know Jesus, they will get heaven. Don't keep yourself away from them. You know, in the church, uh, five myths are busted around in the church. People are saying, they are unreached. No, they are not. There are hundreds and millions of people who, who are coming to know Lord, even through dreams and visions. They are coming to believe in Jesus. Hundreds of people. We need to approach them. They are not unreached. But we say they are unreached. I am not smart enough. I don't believe it. Everyone has Jesus' story. Everyone. Mr. George, Ethan, Simon, everyone. Everyone has Jesus' story and he can share. And still, if you, if you want to learn, then learn. Learn how to deal with these people. Get some training. You need it. They are terrorists. They are not. They are people like us. They have family bond. They are so family oriented people. They are not. They love. They are, they are good people. But this is on the screens. The media propagated this, this thing. They are terrorists. So because we, we learned that and we are afraid of them and we want to hide ourselves from them. We want to keep us away from them. No. They will not believe. They will. If we will approach them, they will. Who cares? That is so rough. Who cares? God cares. God cares. And I want to ask you, Sister Stephanie has shared these little uh, like you can say a pamphlet or a page. God cares, so do I. I can't stand alone. Are you ready to say that? Would you please stand, stand up and uh, can you declare, God cares, so do I. Can you say that? God cares, so do I. I can't stand aloof. I can't stand aloof. And I want to ask you, like uh, there are seven some uh, seven sorts of declarations and we will not read the bold but we will read all together like we refuse to stand so we will we will read these seven declarations we refuse to stand it idly by as people enter eternity without Christ when we can share the good news that transforms them through any means possible. We refuse to watch people from Christ died, suffer in pain and poverty when we can help restore them in his name. We refuse to fear the darkness that entraps people when common sense says, protect yourself. We will put on the armor of God and pray fervently for the sake of the unreached, we will release what God has given us to empower others to multiply God's kingdom through the gifts he has given them. We will leverage to the best of our ability God's gift of technology to reveal his eternal wisdom to those who have never heard the name of Jesus. We will employ every resource, talent, and ounce of energy God gives us to shine the light of his grace into the darkest recesses of the planet. We will shout from every peak, pinnacle, and rooftop that the only hope for this dying world is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And there are there is God's word available for each declaration. And I want to ask you, that, that would be your assignment. If you will pray this week, pray using these declarations for the lost brethren, for the internationals, for the unreached. Let's pray. Sister Stephanie, would you please close us in prayer?
forgives us all his failings. You have promised to give us the Holy Spirit whenever we're asked. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and empower us. Empower us to believe in your name. Empower us to speak your word and speak your truth and witness to the gospel. Empower us to not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ or in the power of salvation. Thank you, Father, for giving us all good things. Thank you for giving us all that we need for life and godliness. And now go with us as you send us and give us confidence that your Holy Spirit is with us. For you said it is not by might and it's not by power, but it is by your Spirit you said it. So we go in the power of the Spirit. We go in the grace of God. We go with the mercy of Christ himself to our neighbors, to the international, to those who don't know you. And you have promised that when we open our mouths, your Holy Spirit will fill it with your word. So it doesn't depend on us. It depends on you. Jesus, you said if we lift you up, you will draw all men unto you. Yes, Lord. All we have to do is lift up the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. You will draw all men unto you. God, uh, I I want to ask prayer for Sister Bertha. Uh, Brother Ron told me to pray for Bertha, and I want to ask you, uh, uh, please have everyone prepare your heart to pray for Sister Bertha so she would get healing. She needs Jesus' healing touch. Father above, we are very thankful to you for this wonderful day. And Father, we want to give glory to you for your presence. Father, you are here. We uplift your name. We say you thank you for your presence. And Father, we want to bring our sister Bertha before your throne while she is suffering with arthritis pain and she needs your healing touch. Abba, we are here gathered together in Jesus' name and we know and believe Jesus is same yesterday, today and forever. His power is working. His name is awesome. And using his name, using the authority of his name, using his precious name and using the power of his precious blood, we want to ask your grace for Sister Bertha. Heal her, Lord. Touch her, Lord. And Father, we want to hear this good news. Our sister is doing great. Above, we give glory to you. We know Jesus is the name that is pleased by you. We, we can take that name and we can come before your throne with boldness. And we know in Jesus' name we receive. Abba, we give glory to you that you have heard us. And we say you thank you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.